You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, weekly art history for all ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're going to be talking about the work of Yayoi Kusama. Now, Yayoi Kusama is one of the most popular contemporary artists with her infinity rooms drawing massive crowds wherever they're installed. In the infinity rooms, the walls are covered in mirrors, creating reflections of reflections that seem to go on forever. The idea of playing with reflections was a fixture in Kusama's work pretty much right from the start. As I covered in my previous episode about Yayoi Kusama, she grew up in Japan where her family owned a nursery. She was surrounded by plants and looked at nature around her, imagining not only what was beyond the mountains and the landscape, but what was inside the plants, the rocks, the dirt. This is where we get her signature polka dots, although she refers to the repeated dots as infinity nets, a visualization of the structures that make up all of the things in our world and even our universe. I suppose I might think of the dots as representing cellular structures, even atoms, but she would call them infinity nets. I guess the net signifying that all of these seemingly discrete bits, the building blocks like atoms, are bonded into molecules making up larger compounds and that everything is made up of tiny bits but that all of those little bits are connected in some fashion. Growing up in Japan, Kusama enjoyed art but she was not encouraged by her family. In fact, she described her mother as abusive, and understandably, Kusama sought to escape. At a second-hand bookshop in Matsumoto, Japan, Yayoi Kusama stumbled upon a book of paintings by George O'Keefe. O'Keefe was the only American artist that Kusama knew anything about at that time. A friend of hers had told her that Georgia O'Keefe was the most famous painter in the U.S., Now, in a turn that shows just how different the world used to be, Yayoi Kusama was actually able to find George O'Keefe's address. She rode the train from Matsumoto to Tokyo and on to the American embassy, where she went through a copy of a book, uh, Who's Who, where she was elated to find George O'Keefe's mailing address. Kusama wrote to O'Keefe telling her of her dream to be an artist in America and included some of her recent watercolor paintings. Amazingly enough, Georgia O'Keefe wrote back. She encouraged Kusama, but it wasn't the standard sort of, hey kid, those paintings look great kind of thing. O'Keefe encouraged Kusama to come to America, and while they only met in person once, Georgia O'Keefe and Yayoi Kusama would maintain correspondence for years, with O'Keefe offering career advice and support to the up-and-coming artist. Now, with Georgia O'Keefe's encouragement, Yayoi Kusama decided to take a huge risk. She believed that Japan was too traditional and that her best chance at happiness would require moving to the U.S. She found a distant relative to sponsor her, On her immigration papers, she stated she was coming to Seattle for a solo exhibition. Financing the journey, though, proved to be quite difficult because Japan had laws restricting the amount of yen, that's the Japanese currency, that could be converted into American dollars. She also wasn't allowed to take a lot of the currency out of the country. So Yayoi Kusama had to sew her American money into her dress and stuffed dollar bills into the toes of her shoes in order to get the money out of the country with her. As I said, the world used to be a very different place. In the middle of the 20th century, just after World War II, Japan had some really strict currency and trade controls in place, but they would start to loosen up around the 1960s. At the age of 27, Yayoi Kusama arrived in Seattle, and a year later she finally made it to the destination she had dreamed of, New York City. 
Unfortunately, dreams and reality seldom match. Kusama struggled both mentally and financially. Her studio was cold with broken windows. She barely had enough money to eat. She described making soup from discarded fish heads and eating the rotting lettuce thrown out by a local grocer. New York is said to be the city that never sleeps, and apparently, Yayoi Kusama didn't sleep either. As the constant din of the city kept her awake, she painted tirelessly. She said painting was the only thing she could do to make her living conditions tolerable. Of course, while she may have found it tolerable for some period, being cold, malnourished, lacking sleep, it's not a sustainable lifestyle. And Yayoi Kusama suffered panic attacks that resulted in multiple trips to the emergency room. The doctors there recommended that she see a psychiatrist and get further help. At this tremendously difficult time, George O'Keefe stepped up. She had previously written to Kusama that she would do all she could to help her, and George O'Keefe was a woman of her word. She introduced Kusama to her art dealer, and the thing about the art world is that connections can make all the difference. After some introductions, Kusama got her first solo show at the Brada Gallery, She became friends with Donald Judd, the successful artist and critic who bought one of her pieces and wrote a favorable review. Kusama began to gain some traction in the art world. There are accounts indicating that her work with soft sculpture was, to put it generously, quite the influence on Klaus Oldenburg. The two of them participated in a group show during June of 1962, with Kusama displaying a chair covered in sewn soft sculptures and Oldenburg showing a paper mache piece. Two months later, though, Kusama attended an opening of Klaus Oldenburg's show where his wife Patty had assisted in sewing his soft sculptures. He had not been making soft sculptures prior to that. The story goes that when Patty saw Yayoi Kusama walking into the gallery, she turned to Kusama, saying, I'm sorry, Yayoi. Kusama's career is marked with incidents like that, where she innovated and sometimes other artists would follow her lead but gain more critical acclaim in the process. A similar incident happened with Andy Warhol seeing her work in which she had taken a photo of her boat sculpture and made a thousand copies covering the walls and the ceiling of the gallery. Warhol complimented her on the piece and then sometime later did the same thing covering gallery walls with images of a pink and yellow cow's head. To be fair to both Oldenburg and Warhol, they denied that they copied her. Oldenburg drew a distinction between his monumental soft sculptures and Kusama's work, saying that her work was about repetition of the tiny items covering a surface, whereas his was about the object itself. Warhol would actually credit an art dealer, Ivan Karp, who he said suggested a pastoral image. Perhaps there's truth to both of their defenses. I would also note that the artistic process is always involving some level of appropriation of other people's ideas. We all learn from and take inspiration from myriad sources, and while Oldenburg, Warhol, and others created works with some similar elements to Kusama's, they didn't strictly duplicate her work. She didn't invent the process of sewing or soft sculpture or installation or wallpaper. She did create stunning works that felt fresh and innovative with those techniques. But on some level, it seems a bit narcissistic for an artist to believe that they were the visionary and everyone else must have been ripping them off. Although I guess on some level it's a bit narcissistic to be creating and putting any artwork into the world. The the artist, just by their very nature... I think has to have some amount of ego in them to be creating something and then putting it up on display saying, everybody take a look at this because of my 
brilliant insights. There's something for the world to see and appreciate that I have made. I keep throwing about this term narcissistic. Uh, For those not familiar, the story of Narcissus is uh, ancient mythology. Narcissus was a figure that was known for his extreme beauty, but he did not fall in love with any other person on earth. He ended up going to get a drink of water, and as he looked down at his reflection in the water, he basically just fell in love with himself and sat there staring at himself. And it's on this notion of narcissism that I want to wrap up this longer-than-average mini-episode. Because Yayoi Kusama's piece, Narcissus Garden, is one of the 250 on the list for the AP Art History curriculum, so I want to make sure that I cover that one. In 1966, Yayoi Kusama was on the rise in her career, but she wasn't at the top of the art world. She was not officially invited to the 33rd annual Venice Biennial, but she showed up with a big attention-grabbing installation. In her autobiography, Kusama says that she did get permission from the chairman of the Biennial Committee to install the piece. She put together 1,500 reflective silver plastic spheres. They were mass-produced with a mirror finish. Stepping out of the Italian pavilion, gazing at the sea of silver balls, one could see numerous reflections of the artist, the visitors, the architecture, and the landscape all distorted and appearing smaller in the convex mirror. Part installation, part performance piece— Kusama dressed in a golden kimono to make herself seem exotic and emphasize her otherness or outsider status. She put up a sign saying, quote, your narcissism for sale, end quote. She was calling attention to the commodification of art, and she acted as a street peddler selling the spheres to passersby for $2 each. Biennial officials eventually stepped in to make her stop the street peddling aspect, but the installation was allowed to remain. She simultaneously called out the shallow commercialization of art and packaged herself draped in a stereotype to break into the elite art scene. The piece has remained popular and installed in numerous institutions in the decades that followed. Now, in the age of smartphones, As people take selfies to post on social media, capturing their repeated reflections with phone in hand, it reaches a new level of calling out the viewer's ego. But as I wrap up recording this episode on Narcissus Garden so I can broadcast my thoughts to all of you, I feel it's only appropriate that I ask all of you to leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening, and please tell a friend about the show to help more people discover this superb podcast with a host whose face is most beautifully suited to an audio medium. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.